I met Elder Cook in January, I think January of uh, 1961. Mm. We'd been out on our missions a few months, not very long by then, and we had a mission activity, and he was a legend. He was a legend even <laughs> then. How long were you companions for? Not very long at the end. We were, we were kind of together in leadership a uh, month or two at the end of our missions. Hi everyone, Nemo here. It's certainly not news to anyone who's been around this channel for a while that three of the current apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints serve their missions here in the United Kingdom. And as you've just heard, two of them serve together. We were, we were kind of together in leadership a uh, month or two at the end of our missions. What's even more interesting, however, is the time period that these two served in. Quinton L. Cook arrived on the 30th of August 1960 and initially served in Bristol. Jeffrey R. Holland arrived on the 14th of September 1960 and initially served in Norwich. In November 1960, this article appeared in the British LDS periodical, The Millennial Star. Given the years they served, it is very possible that two of the current Quorum of the Twelve were involved in the morally and ethically problematic practice of baseball baptisms. In 1959, Latter-day Saint missionaries began sharing their sports skills with British youth. We'd start playing baseball. Kids would come and want to play. And so we taught them how to play baseball. Then we wrote down their names and their addresses so that we could go and meet their parents and get permission for them to play. They gave me a form to fill out, which uh, was filled out. And my mum did say, this is a bit strange, son, you know. I said, sorry, right, mum, it's only to play baseball. So she signed the form. The form gave permission for the young men to be baptised. And while the film we just watched shows an active member who resulted from the baseball baptism program, the overwhelming majority of those baptised as part of this program never actively attended the church. So how did all this come about? Fronting as a baseball club was not a bizarre innovation of British missionaries, but was an official part of the baseball baptism program throughout Europe. In a conference with missionary leaders from the French Mission, French East Mission and Dutch Mission in April 1961, Elder Alvin R. Dyer outlined each step of the program he had already implemented in Germany. He explained, After the initial baseball game, the young people are called together, preferably at the edge of the playing field, where the missionaries tell them who they are and ask them to join a church group or club and to return the following day bringing their friends with them. One of the missionaries asked Elder Dyer, after getting the baseball team baptised, do you continue working with that team? Answer, no sir. Your branch must do the integrating. The ultimate goal of the programme was to baptise the entire family of each boy, and at the minimum to have written permission from the parents for his baptism into the LDS church. However, in the headlong rush to meet baptism quotas, some missionaries decided to avoid opposition by merely asking parents to give permission for the boys to join an American sports club. Others didn't bother to ask permission. Baseball baptisms then was a church-sponsored strategy in the early 1960s of using sports teams to recruit young men into the Mormon church. The architect of this program was member of the First Presidency, Henry D. Moyle. It went hand in hand with his New Era church building program. He built new chapels in anticipation of church growth, rather than based on current needs. This had the slight disadvantage of lacking current tithe payers to pay for those buildings. The solution? High pressure sales tactics and baptismal quotas in order to justify a build it and they will come scenario that would put Kevin Costner to shame. Henry D. Moyle spoke to the missionaries of the British Mission in November 1960, when Geoffrey R. Holland and Quinton L. Cook were fresh to the mission field. They would have been exposed to strong rhetoric about baptising in order to keep up with the rigorous targets, and ignoring missionaries who, quite rightly, had concerns about the baseball baptism programme. You elders need have no concern, no matter from what source the criticism comes, as to whether your baptisms are too fast. Now I want to say a word about this youth programme. I have noted a little apologetic tone in some of your voices about baptising too many young people. Well, don't you put on the brakes. It wasn't just stern words from Henry D. Moyle to get missionaries working hard. According to historian D. Michael Quinn, the baseball baptism programme sometimes alienated missionary companions from each other. One senior companion in the British mission refused to participate in baseball baptisms. This caused daily arguments with his junior companion, who had to share the stigma of failing to reach the British mission's baptism goals. Thousands of miles from their homes, British missionaries faced discrimination, loss of privileges, and even ostracism from the mission president of fellow missionaries, 
all for not baptizing enough new Mormons. And so came the excesses, the incredible excesses of the youth baptism program in Britain. Much of this information is available thanks to the work of D. Michael Quinn and his in-depth article is linked just below the like button. You'll also find a link there where you can become a monthly donor and help me continue to provide this content. Now, despite the pressure on the missionaries and the cost to those who did not participate, the Baseball Baptisms program, on paper at least, was successful in gathering the converts that Moyle was after in order to fund his building program. However, this failed to materialize into actual tithing revenue. And so despite Moyle's instructions for the church to cease publishing an itemized account of its finances, opposition to his fiscal behavior began to build. And the increasingly precarious financial situation combined with public opposition to the baseball baptism program ultimately led to Moyle's removal from his position overseeing church finances in 1963. By July, 1963, Joseph Fielding Smith, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, was now openly criticising the spending proclivities of President Moyle, also concerning the unorthodox way in which youngsters had been baptised in the church. When Marion D. Hanks was appointed to clean up this mess, hundreds if not thousands of young boys who had never actively attended an LDS sacrament meeting were now having to be excommunicated, as that was the only way to remove someone's records from the church in the 1960s. As a missionary in Great Britain in 1964, under the direction of Mission President Mark E. Peterson, D. Michael Quinn himself performed these excommunication trials in a branch over which he presided. I was assigned to preside over another branch that had eight active Mormons out of a membership roster of 150. In accordance with Elder Peterson's post-baseball program, I began holding church courts to excommunicate those who didn't want to be Mormon, who had never wanted it. As I spoke with these boys, some were confused, others were bitter, many were indifferent. The most painful reaction to see was their embarrassment when they learned that excommunication was the only way their names could be removed from the records of the church. The stigma of excommunication was the only remedy that church procedures allowed at the time. So did Quinton L. Cook and Geoffrey R. Holland actively participate in baseball baptisms? Well, we know that they went on the church history tour for missionaries that was announced by President Woodbury. Father Holland and I came in 1960 and the first time we ever met was uh... 1961 at the River Ribble, yeah. North, the baptismal site. The, we came up from uh, London and had a chance to be together the first week in January. This tour was only available to missionaries who had reached a baptismal quota of four or more, and both Cook and Holland clearly rose to the challenge. Ultimately, we can't say for certain that they got young men to play baseball and baptise them off the back of it. However, these two men have been very successful in our church's gerontocratic leadership system. Success in that system is achieved in no small part through conformity, deference to leaders, and not rocking the boat. These were the same characteristics relied upon by the leaders that oversaw the baseball baptism program and its accompanying high baptismal targets. I'd welcome Elder Holland or Elder Cook to address this period in the church's history and their direct involvement or lack thereof next time they decide to wax lyrical about having served their missions here in the UK. With all that said, let me know in the comments what you think.